our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Word made flesh, our life and our salvation. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us, that we may be reconciled to one another. For the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, a new thing I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. God, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps in the ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children forward for the children's message. Good morning. Good morning. It's so great to have you guys here today. Hey, what'd you think about that snow when you woke up this morning? Cool. Pretty cool. I thought so too. It was so exciting. It was falling even before the sun was up. It was so beautiful and it was falling so soft and light on the trees. Well, today we're going to talk about a game that I bet you guys have played. Has anybody played Follow the Leader? Yeah? yeah? Me too. Follow the leader, right? So the leader starts out and is going along, and you fall in behind them, right? And where the leader goes, you go, right? So sometimes they're walking in a straight line. Sometimes they're walking in a curvy line. Sometimes they're walking up and over things. And when we're following the leader, we try and do the same thing, right? Yeah. Well, that's what the disciples were doing, right? When Jesus said, come follow me, he wanted them to come and do what he did. Now, it wasn't just walking in the steps where he was walking, but he wanted them to be sharing God's love with people the same way he was. And it was, you know, a tough thing. It wasn't always easy. Just like when we play follow the leader, it's not always easy, is it? Sometimes it's really hard. 
but Jesus promised to be there with them. And so when we hear about the disciples following Jesus, we can think about following the leader, that Jesus is our leader too. And we are following him. And the way we follow him is to be kind to people and loving and let them know how much God loves them. Which is pretty fun, huh? All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for loving us so much. We thank you that as people who are your disciples, who call ourselves Christians, we are following you, our leader. Help us to do that every day. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up. I think, oh, there is Miss Lola right there at the back. You're welcome to go to jam time with her if you would like. first reading this morning comes from Isaiah, the ninth chapter, the first four verses. There will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time, the Lord brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read portions of Psalm 27 responsibly. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter, hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high upon a rock. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. When my heart seeks your message, seek my face. Your face, O Lord, I repeat. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away. You have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Our second reading comes from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean to say is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. 
For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds that your word and Holy Spirit will dwell within us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so many of you know that water skiing has been a passion of mine for a very long time. I learned to ski when I was nine, and I learned to slalom when I was ten. And so I've spent a lot of time, really a lot of time skiing, and, and we've taught all kinds of people to ski. And learning to water ski, there could not be anything that sounds more foolish than that, because you tell people grab onto this rope and we're going to yank you through this mass of water really hard and and perhaps if you don't fall down you may enjoy being up for a while <laughs> which is not that different a description from a lot of other speed sports but the thing about water skiing is that so much of it doesn't really make sense when you're learning how to do it the mantra that we start people out with is arms straight, knees bent. So can we try that together? Arms straight, knees bent, right? Because you have to do that in order to ski. Now, most of us, when we think about skiing, particularly if you haven't skied before, imagine yourself like on the cover of one of those 1950s magazines, the ski club, right? Standing up straight and tall like this. That is not going to work. Not until you have skied for a very long time. The way you ski is like this, right? You need to have your knees bent and your arms straight. Now, you can give intellectual assent to that. You can think, okay, they've taught people to ski before. That'll go over fine. And you're in the water, and you have your knees bent and your arms straight, and you say, hit it, All right? <laughs> and suddenly the water is plowing past you, and if miraculously you're able to get up, what your body automatically wants you to do, because as you get 
out of the water, the resistance against you is reduced. So it feels like the rope is going slack and well, you don't want that to happen. So what are you going to do? Pull those arms right in. And as soon as you do that, right down on the ground and we come around with the boat and say, do you know what happened? <laughs> like, yeah, I fell! Right? <laughs> but it's, you pulled your arms in, and they say, no. And you can show them the video that happens from the boat, and you can see them going, Wah! and they just have a hard time believing it because your body thinks it's foolishness to keep those arms straight. It's not the only time in life that doing something seems like total foolishness. When Clara Barton and Florence Nightingale during the Civil War were trying to convince the surgeons that really what we need to do is wash your hands and the saws between people, and they looked down at their aprons covered with all kinds of different people's blood and their saws and knives stained with it and thinking, Why in the world would we do that? That sounds ridiculous. Because the things that we're used to, to change them often seems foolish. There are all kinds of things in our life that are like that, things that seem to work for us. And when someone tells us another way, particularly if it's a better way that's significantly different than the way we do it, well... We have a hard time with it. We struggle with that. And Jesus sets that up with the disciples as he walks here along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It says that after John the Baptist is arrested, he has made Capernaum his home base, and he's walking along the shore. Now it sounds like he's walking from like Destin to Pensacola or something, right? <laughs> it sounds like it's this long walk. The walk from the little tiny village of Capernaum to where the fishing boats are is like maybe one or two hundred yards. It's like he can see their faces before he leaves the village. It's not a huge walk to go and see them. And not only that, he has certainly seen them before. There are not that many fishermen supplying fish to this little village. So he certainly met them before. In John's Gospel, we have him having several encounters with them before. But as he walks by, he says to them, Come and follow me, and I'll have you fish for people. And it sounds like Andrew and Peter are fishing, doesn't it? Because after all, it says they're throwing their net, and they were fishermen, right? They're not fishing. You know how you can tell? It's daytime. Right? They're in the shallows. They are casting out that net to see if the mending they did worked. If they got that stitch right, and if the net is not tangled on itself and it's spreading out, right? You didn't fish during the day with the net because the fish can see it coming. <laughs> right? You fish at night. And James and John and Zebedee are in the next boat. And as Peter and Andrew and Jesus walk by. Jesus says to John and James, follow me. And it says that they just get right up out of the boat, leave their nets, and leave their dad there still mending the nets in the boat. Now, we don't have any dialogue from Zebedee here, but I wonder if he said, hey, hey, the mending's not done. Where are you going? (coughs) Excuse me, but I hope that he saw something else. That he recognized something important was happening with his boys. Because Zebedee's name is remembered when so many others aren't. And so it was important in the Christian tradition to keep that name and carry it forward in the scriptures. And Jesus is telling them to come and follow me. And though it sounded like it was just a game of follow the leader from the children's sermon, he's saying to leave their 
jobs that they have worked years at developing the skills on, jobs that supported their families, that supported other workers, jobs that sustained them and provided a vital service to the community. He says, yeah, just chuck that and follow me and I'll have you fish for people, which always makes me think of a cartoon that somehow Peter and Andrew, as they leave their nets, they grab one, and Jesus is teaching them to walk up on people and, hi yeah, <laughs> net them, right? <laughs> fish for people that way, but that's not what he's asking them to do. He's asking them really to leave behind all the skills they developed, except perhaps patience and being able to get over disappointment that comes again and again when you don't catch anything and follow me sounds kind of ridiculous it sounds foolish to leave that to leave what they were doing to follow this itinerant preacher who is walking around But in following Jesus, they caught a vision of that promise from the prophet Isaiah that a light was dawning in a land that was full of darkness. See, really, it doesn't make any sense to follow Jesus unless what Jesus is offering is better than what you already have. And what Jesus is offering, what Jesus calls them into, is a life where they know that they are precious to God. Where they know that God's forgiveness is with them. That the peace of God is in their hearts. Where they have hope. Not because they're going to be economically successful. They would have been doing better if they'd stayed fishing. But hope because this same Jesus who called them to follow is the one who was willing to give his life on the cross and rise again for them, to offer them and promise them the hope of eternal life. that all the things they faced, all the brokenness they saw in their lives, all of the strain and struggles that they went through were inconsequential compared to the wonder of God's love for them, compared to the light and hope of God's love that they were being invited into. And we have the same call. Jesus isn't only calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John there by the seashore. Jesus Christ is calling to us, to you and to me as well, and offering us that same hope, that same wonder, that same promise of eternal life, that same peace that is greater than the troubles of this world. and calls us and invites us to carry that message of God's forgiving love to a world that, like the lands of Naphtali and Zebulun, are so often in darkness, so often caught up in the darkness of brokenness and fear and racism and sexism and all those other isms that are out there, that break people apart from one another. Jesus invites us to share a different message. A message where all are welcome. A message of hope in the midst of struggle. Now, even if we buy into that entirely and we are committed fully and trust that the Spirit is going to give us the power to do that, a lot of times it's going to look like, well, skiing, right? We may make it up and then suddenly... 
right? We're under gasping and <coughs> sputtering and thinking, wait, I was on top of the water just a second ago. How did that happen? But Jesus doesn't say, you know what? You had your try. Sorry, you're out of there. He pulls around and says, ready to go again? Amen. We rise and join together in our hymn of the day, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. It's number 696. joined together in professing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Make your church one in purpose, proclaiming the message of the cross. Help us to work together across differences. Energize ecumenical partnerships, including the World Council of Churches and the Lutheran World Federation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
we rejoice at the bounty of your creation. Fill the land and sea with your abundance. Bless the harvests in the southern hemisphere and fallow fields in the northern hemisphere. Equip farmers to till and keep the earth sustainably. Merciful God, receive our prayer. In Christ, your reign comes near and calls all to repentance. Break the rod of the oppressor in every nation. Dispel the shadow of death in places of war and persecution. Grant us leaders who lift the yokes that burden those in need. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be a stronghold for those in trouble and a rock for all who are afraid. Rouse communities to care for neighbors who need shelter or facing maltreatment or are isolated and lonely. Especially we pray this day for Ralph, Vivian, Anne, Bill, Joan, Paula, Brenda, Nancy, Lucy, Kenny, Pastor Lisa, Diane, Joe, the family and friends of Nancy, and those who we name in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Sustain the ministries of this congregation and all the churches in this community. Nurture each congregation's unique witness to your presence. Foster mutual respect and inspire our cooperation in loving our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We praise you for the faithful who have gone ahead of us, both famous and unknown. Help us to leave our nets and follow, <coughs> and bring us with them to the fullness of your promise of eternal life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share a sign of peace with one another. Peace be with you. I invite you to be seated. A couple announcements for us to share together. In our prayer concerns today, we added to those we've been praying for, um, the Joe Gleason, who is battling cancer. Also, as you walked in, you may have seen the large Christmas cactus hanging out here. And this Christmas cactus was started as a planting from Nancy Smithers' grandmother on their wedding, and has continued and was here um, yesterday at the memorial and was at the visitation as a witness to her love and care, and we pray for Nancy's family as they go forward, that they would know God's comfort and care. At this time, we have a word from the Stewardship Committee. Good morning. Good morning. Some of you may know me. My name is Dennis Jacoby. I've been coming here for Zor. I think I asked my wife the other day how long it's been. She said eight years. It feels like 20. Right? Um, but in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> because the Zor community has always been so opening, um, so welcoming, we just feel at home here. And it just feels like I've known so many of you all my life. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Stewardship Committee again for donations, and I don't just mean the financial donations we, donations we do every year for the Fall Appeal, but also donations of time, the food you give, time that goes into maintaining this building, which is a pillar for the community as you drive by, it supports the word of God at the committees and the people that come here to play pickleball, the time to volunteer for the committees to make sure that the operations of the church go off without a hitch, Right. The time that goes into all of the different things to volunteer for the community, to support the community. Bringing of food and, and the alike to the food panel, pantry, but yes, also the financial giving that you guys have, have donated over time. Um, so with that, 
please, if you have a promise to increase your givings, it's up to you to make sure that adjustment happens, either electronically with your banking or in the plates when you donate here. Uh, and again, I just want to thank you all for all of the gifts that you have given to Zor. Ultimately, they go to promote God's word to bring us all to his love. So thank you again for everything you do. Thank you, Dennis. Zor's PCU food item for the month of January is canned fruit, and we invite you to pick some of that up when you are out shopping and bring it back to the cupboards that are by the elevator in the gathering space. Zor's annual meeting is scheduled for next Sunday, January 29th at 12.15 p.m., immediately following this service time. Please make an effort to be here to take part in that important meeting. After a several year break, Kitchen of Hope is returning their ministry to Zor this coming Friday, January 27th at noon. If you would like to take part in this free meal, um, there is a sign up sheet on the welcome desk in the gathering space, and we would invite you to sign up or you're welcome to call into the office, but we'd really like that to all happen by Tuesday because they're going to be buying food on Wednesday and they need to know how much to buy. If you are joining us online today, um, we invite you to text your name to 419-731-6533 so that we can know that you were here worshiping together with us. And as we prepare to receive your offerings, we invite you to fill out and pass the pew pads. And if you are a new visitor, we invite you to fill out the green new visitor card so we can get to know you better. Congregation, please rise. Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings and thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. 
You we magnify and adore through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son, and in the miracle of the water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in prophets' hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the Word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection, and we look for the hope of his coming. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God, incarnate power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. All who believe in the loving presence of Christ are welcome to come and receive at his table. For communion distribution, we'll be beginning at the back pews. You'll make your way down the center aisle, receive the bread, then from the trays on either side of the aisle, from the outside rings, the red wine, or from the center ring, the white grape juice. And then after placing your empties in the baskets, return back to your seats by way of the side aisles. Come, for all is ready.
Congregation, please rise. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with you. Amen. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. I invite you to join together with me in our closing hymn. It's number 798. Will you come and follow me?